No, don't fear, true believers. This is not a book written by Frank Miller. Thankfully. Although, I have done a video on Frank Miller's Holy Terror, I did it for Halloween last year, which you can watch by clicking on that gray box up in the right. That's right, this is a story about that time Batman became a priest and everything was really religious. So, released in 1991, written by Alan Brennert, with art by Norman Brayfogle, this is Batman Holy Terror. The book begins in Gotham City, oh sorry, Gotham Town. Why does Gotham Town look like this and why is it called Gotham? town, I hear you ask? Because in 1658, Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of Great Britain, didn't die from malaria, and now England, the United States, and most likely almost the whole world now live under an ultra-religious police state. Also, I guess it stopped most progression of, like, fashion, architecture, laws, and stuff to, like, stay where it was in the 17th century, but as you'll find out, there are cars and televisions and other things of modern day. On the <laughs> anniversary of Cromwell, recovery, September 3rd, Inquisitor Jim Gordon picks up the cross of the Privy Council personal physician Thomas Wayne, who lies dead on the street. Bet you didn't see that one coming. Cut to the Lord Commissioner's office. Gordon tells the judge that Joseph Chill was the man who killed the Waynes, but the judge is like, Joseph Chill was arrested a month ago. How do you propose he killed two people? See as how he was in Coventry. And Gordon's like, Will you tell me, you white-wigged wanker? The killer left a gold cross on the body. You'd expect he'd only do something of the sort if he was instructed. Then, as I figured out his identity, he's dead in prison. Quite good timing, I'd say, wouldn't you? Then the commissioner tells Gordon to fuck off, because he doesn't understand how Gotham works, because Gordon just transferred in from New Amsterdam. Apparently, colorized television is also a thing. I'm just gonna assume this takes place in the year that the book was written. Anyway, a news anchor, Victoria Vale, because Vicky is for harlots, gives us the idea of the world during her report by telling the viewers things like, the resistance forces battling in Brazil against the Commonwealth, or the hanging of industrialist Oliver Queen for his support of underground Jewish pornographers like Isaac Singer. Wait, what? Isaac Singer was born in 1811 and died in 1875. That means this takes place in the mid to late 1800s to the early 1900s. Because by 1911, he'd be 100 years old. Uh, anyway, 20 or so years later, Bruce Wayne and his butler, Alfred Pennyworth, say their goodbyes as Bruce has sold off all of his belongings and furniture to the state, leaving only the empty Wayne Manor because he's like gonna join the priesthood or whatever. Bruce offers for Alfred to stay at the manor, but Alfred says that he's made a pact or something to take care of the family, and now the family has left, and that pact has been fulfilled. Alfred asks if Bruce is sure about his decision, and Bruce Bruce says that he's found peace with God. Then they hug and Alfred leaves as Bruce begins to tour the empty halls. Then he like walks into his gym and does a little quick gymnastics routine just for himself when Jim Gordon appears. Gordon's like, good moves. Uh, you know, you'd become a great inquisitor. Anyway, there are things I have to tell you. I told you I never found out uh, who killed your parents, but that was a lie. Then Gordon explains to Bruce what we just read five pages prior, and that Bruce has joined the very system that killed his parents. Bruce gets angry and kicks Gordon out while Gordon apologizes. Later, Bruce reads his father's journal about a secret clinic he and Martha set up for the people of Gotham Town, who are like downtrodden and or were tortured slash experimented on by the state. Bruce talks about this discovery with Dr. Charles McKnighter, aka Midnight. Bruce is upset, and Charles tells him that Thomas took a great risk keeping the journal, but he kept it so that one day Bruce would learn the truth. Then Bruce is like, I found out that the god I thought I loved is responsible for my parents' deaths. Now what do I do, Charles? Then Charles tells him that God is the one who did this. God's self-appointed interpreters are. Bruce audibly expresses his contempt for the state, and Charles says, Oh, I know your anger very well. I felt it when an agent threw acid in my eyes when I began working with the underground. I felt it again when I lost my comrades, Alan Scott, Carter, and Sierra. Was that her name? What was her name? Something exotic. All of them. All caught. 
all executed. And Bruce is like, whoa, 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 hey, hold on. I don't want to fight the whole state or anything. I just want to, like, avenge my parents, man. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's not get carried away. Uh, so how would I do that? Then Charles tells Bruce that he can't, and that there is no underground anymore. Bruce says that there surely must be somebody with the power to oppose the state, and Charles tells him that there are rumors about someone held captive in Cathedral, which is, like, the main cathedral. Someone called... The Green Man. Hmm, I wonder who that is. Cut to a church. Bruce is ordained by the church, ministers, or whatever, and in his narration, he says that he is at peace again, and he finally knows what he must do. After that, he stays late at the church to pray, and he enters the bishop's office and logs into his computer and finds that the only three members of the Privy Council from the year of his parents' death are still alive. Later, he enters a massive cave system he used to play in as a child. Because you know, that's what normal kids do. And he places down a box containing a demon costume from a play his father was in. Cut to the residence of Lemuel Brown, High Lord Magistrate. Brown sleeps very soundly in his bed when a shadowy demon rips open his bed canopy. The monster lands on the bed and says, Good evening to you, Lemuel. You've been expecting me for some time, haven't you? Expecting you? Well, yes, Lemuel. Isn't it written that he who smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death? God's words. You lived by them for years. The Batman grabs Brown by the neck and asks if he remembers their names. Brown says Wayne was nothing but a traitor and that he would have voted for execution the first chance he had, but the Star Chamber decided his fate. Then <laughs> Bruce is like, Star Chamber? Damn it! Gordon was wrong! Now what the fuck am I gonna do with this guy? Oh, I know. I'll force him to strip naked and put on a sexy French maid's outfit with lipstick and tie him to his bed, of course. The perfect justice. Then Batman swings away into the city. At Cathedral, Reverend Wayne walks inside and enters an office room to consult some demographics of a parish he'll be taking over. Wink. Bruce looks up where the Star Chamber is and finds it's located in one of the subterranean levels, which also has the highest clearance. So he goes down as far as he can, using uh, the bishop he works for, Caspian's information, until he reaches the detention center. Bruce reluctantly detains the guards before the lights turn on and he hears a loud sound coming from the cells. Bruce walks down there to find a man who is able to vibrate himself, trying to break the glass of his prison. Batman asks if he's all Right, and the prisoner says, What the hell do you care? Who are you anyway, one of Erdale's latest projects? I'm nobody's project. Are you a prisoner here? No, this is just a department store display, and I'm actually a mannequin who came to life. Of course I'm a prisoner! Who the devil are you in that silly costume? Bruce tells the man that he's there to find something, and the costume is to hide his identity. Then he asks how the man just did what he did, that thing with his hand, and the man reveals that his name is Barry Allen. Real surprise there. And through one of those chemical lightning freak accidents, he somehow gains super speed powers. Barry says that Erdell made the glass specifically to readjust his vibrations somehow. He like starts going on about how much he misses his family and friends and he's been trapped down there so long and then Bruce is like, why don't you just use both hands at different vibrations to break the glass? So Barry does it and it works. And then this other prisoner is like, hey, I can do that too, watch. Then he explodes. But Barry explains his molecules come back together eventually. Bruce asks who these people are and Barry tells them that they're all just hamsters in a cage. Then he shows Bruce all the other poor people who are experimented on. They get to Arthur's tank and Barry tells Arthur that he's escaped and he'll get him out too. Bruce asks if he is another experiment. Barry's like, kinda. Arthur here is a test subject with like amphibious and telepathic powers. Barry then says that they found another Mer woman. No, not Mera. Her name was Lori, based on Lori Lamaris, who was a literal mermaid that Superman dated for a little. Anyway, they made them mate, and Lori died in childbirth. And the result is this horrific half human, half mermaid fish woman. Then they tried gene splicing, and the result of that is a shark with muscular legs wearing a speedo. Why? Why does the shark need a speedo? I assume it's because it has a dick. Then they tried the same chemicals that gave Barry his powers and they created this like massive abomination that repeatedly just tries to kill itself. Then they're attacked by fucking Zatanna, which causes the glass holding the daughter of Arthur to break and it like flies out into the hall and gasps for air. And as it dies, it manages to finally say, free, free. 
Then Barry gets pissed that Zatanna killed this fish thing and runs at her at super speed, but she makes the air become solid and stomps Barry. As Zatanna is gloating and hypnotizing an unconscious Barry, Batman is lamenting the death of this fish woman he just met. And even met is a bit of a stretch. He just fucking saw it in a tank maybe a minute before it died. Anyway, he throws gas pellets at Zatanna, landing them in her mouth, which activate, probably in her throat, most likely killing her slowly with the gas. Batman pulls Barry away from the gas and awakens him and then down the hall Barry sees Erdell walking towards them and Batman's like what the hell is happening I just came here to avenge my parents and I just witnessed so much crazy shit I don't know what's going on Barry screams at Erdell for how much of a sob he is and Barry races at him but Erdell presses a remote which ignites Barry whose last words are Iris his charred corpse falls to the ground and Batman runs over and grieves for yet another new friend who died a few minutes after meeting and <laughs> I'm sorry Batman but <laughs> look at his fucking face Erd Hell explains that the chemical aura the speed force protects him from friction until Erdell managed to figure out how to neutralize it with a little remote then Batman rushes Erdell but is stopped by a man made of clay and Batman's like what in the name of God is that oh my god it's Matt Hagen Clayface and Batman's freaking out as he's subdued by this creature so Clayface subdues Batman and forces him to walk down the hall with Erdell to his office where they find the green man Erdell explains that a god fearing couple in Kansas found him and gave the baby to the government. Unfortunately, he grew far too rebellious for their liking and Erdell killed him using a radioactive piece of debris found near the crash site. Now he remains crucified on display. Wow, I didn't realize Zack Snyder wrote this. Then Bruce narrates, I have no idea who this man is. I've never seen him before in my life. But suddenly, I feel an unfathomable sense of loss, of sorrow of hope destroyed and discarded. Which is uh, kind of screwed up if you really think about it. This implies that Bruce Wayne in this universe, somewhere deep within his like subconscious, knows that that's Superman and knows that Superman is a beacon of hope. This also means that like other characters, like Barry, probably knew deep down that this isn't how things are meant to be. It means that no matter what Earth a story takes place on, the characters will always have the tiniest idea of what could have been, i.e., whichever Earth uh, the main canon of DC uses. In this example, it would be New Earth. Anyway, Bruce is empowered to do good against all this evil he has witnessed and escapes from Clayface's clutches. He battles Clayface until he tosses him into some nearby liquid nitrogen, freezing Clayface, allowing Batman to smash him with a fucking chair. Arms then Erdell just pulls out a gun and he opens fire as Bruce leaps for the nearest and safest cover, the dead body. Which you could say is because Bruce instinctively just knows of Kal-El's bulletproof skin. Again, a memory that he would get from the main DC universe. Anyway, Erdell's bullets hit the cadaver and just ricochets off it straight back into his chest. <laughs> and killing him. That's how he dies. He shoots himself. Then Batman looks up at the green man and smiles. Anyway, back to our main storyline. Remember that? Bruce enters the Star Chamber, which is like a shadow arm of the government apparently, to find an old man who is a member of the chamber. The old guy asks why Bruce is there and Bruce is like, I'm looking for records of a certain proceeding. The old man tells him that he's presided on the court for over 40 years and offers his help. And then he walks down the stairs and asks for the name of the couple that was sentenced to death. Bruce is like, uh, I, uh, I'd rather not say. Ah, uh, I take it. These people were close to you. The names don't matter. You know who's responsible? Everyone. And no one. Are you familiar with the old tradition of firing squads? How one gun out of the entire squad is unloaded so any man on the line can think that perhaps he wasn't the one that killed the victim. The Star Chamber follows a similar tradition. If the charge is a capital crime, twelve magistrates vote on the guilt or innocence by secret ballot. No one knows who voted. There are no records. Does that answer your question? Then Bruce grabs him by the collar and says, What if I were to ask you if you remembered how you voted for a specific case? What if you told me you voted death? Then you would most likely kill me. Uh, do you think that would satisfy you? Then Bruce releases the man and says, No, it wasn't you who killed them. 
It wasn't the Star Chamber. It was the system that gave you the power. That's what I have to kill. The old man says he can try, and Bruce says that they'll have to see. Then Bruce walks away. Cut to Bruce preaching at his church. He says goodbye to everyone as they leave, and as night falls, he removes his robe and dons a black cloak. Then Batman stands on the rooftops and narrates, I can't help but wonder what might have happened if, on that night 20 years ago, there had been a different ending, a happier one. Or, instead of being killed by the state, mother and father truly had been victims of a random, senseless street crime. Perhaps everything would have been different. Then he swings above his city into the night. The end. <laughs> <laughs>